Hello, 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 and welcome in. Welcome into tonight's live. Hopefully I'm not crooked. My camera looks a little crooked, but that's okay. Welcome back if you're a member and you called our members live earlier. Well, welcome back for another round. Another round. I've got my smiley shirt on tonight, so hopefully we'll have some good news through this live. Hopefully they'll find a couple missing people that we're going to talk about tonight. Easter, hey, it's a, full of miracles. You never know. You never know. But welcome in, everybody. Um, hopefully you guys have some really nice Easter plans. And if you don't, hopefully you're taking care of yourself because that's what's important. Um, but if you're new to the channel, we do talk true crime daily here. So if that's something you're into, please subscribe to the channel. We'd love to have you. And um, don't forget to like the video because, you know, we have to tell you that. <laughs> oh, CJK, you you did the members. or you played it afterwards. We're going to, um, we'll have another members live too. We're all make it to where it's, you know, far in advance. So everyone kind of knows. Um, today was kind of just a spur of the moment. I knew we would do one, but I wasn't sure when. So um, actually, I forgot to pin my comment up here. So I'm going to do that really quick. Okay. And then we'll get into tonight's case. Let's see here. So we're going to do, we're going to do a double, double case tonight. We're going to do dual cases. There's so many different cases that have so many different updates. I feel like we could be here all night talking about different cases. Um, but we're going to focus on Caleb Harris and Sebastian Rogers tonight. Sebastian Rogers has been a really big hot topic for everybody. I mean, 15 year old boy disappears with no shoes. Well, Caleb Harris is kind of the same way, except for he was 21 and he had no shoes, no shoes. What's up with no, everyone has no shoes, double feature areas, just like the movies. So let me see here. Who do we have in the chat tonight? Let me say hello to people. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, Jan. Pickle me. Leslie's in here. We got a lot of people in here. I saw Citizen Sleuth and Nicole. Pickle me. I'll again. <laughs> if I miss you, I'm sorry. I'm kind of going down print it fast. Blame Erica Genevieve. I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> hey, Stephanie. Welcome in. Happy Easter, everybody. Hopefully, you guys have some good Easter plans. I don't really have anything planned, but you know. Hey, yeah, welcome in. I'm kind of just tapping on everyone's name. <laughs> Cat's Life said, I'm here. <laughs> and I finally got to my um, comment section today. I didn't, I, I that and replied to comments in a couple of days. So if you get a bunch of comments, like love comments, you know, from me, that's because I loved all your comments. Thanks, Otto. I appreciate that. I curled it tonight. I decided, you know, let's do something a little different. Welcome in, everybody. Hey, Harlow. It's good to see you guys. Hey, Aries, I already said hi to you, I feel like, but you know, hey, Kat K, Spilled Beans is in here, Terry Dean, Lorena, we got everybody, Amy Harris, we got the whole crew, there's the crew, they're all, they're all coming in, um, but yeah, if you guys don't mind just taking a second, hit the like button, it will, it sends us into the algorithm, and once we get into the algorithm, it just is the best thing for a creator, we feel so much, we just feel so much joy, so it's free too, <laughs> it's free to give me that joy. Really? I just watched how University of Idaho scamming its students off the tragedy. What are they doing solo? Man. So speaking of different cases, we were covering a case. I think we only did maybe one or two lives over it. Actually, um, Jan brought it to my attention. And it's a little boy, 16 years old, by the name of Preston Lord. And um, I put it on the community page today. Let me look up a print. Um, picture of him so you can see who I'm talking about. So as soon as Jan sent me this, I was like, oh my gosh, this kid is adorable. And like, who would want to like possibly hurt this little boy, you know, 16 years old. Um, he was at a party basically. And some kids decided to beat the living crap out of him. I mean, literally they killed him. Um, it was bad. I've read a little bit of the paperwork documents tonight and, mm, I heard it's like a thousand pages. Y'all, y'all, I don't know. It's crazy. This is going to be one of those you're going to want to stick around. You're going to want to hear the deep, even though the details are not going to be good, you're going to want to know about this case. It's very sad. It's very sad. Like the kids were partying. Um, yeah. Adults letting 16 year olds party. That's what you get, you know? I mean, it's, it's insane. I don't know who would ever let someone do that, but, um, some parents think just like, you know, and Trent Lambert, 
Lambert's case, um, parents think it's okay for kids to drink if they're at home with them. So then they're like the cool parents and all the kids go over there and drink. We all had the, we all had the parent. One of us, fr our friends were the cool parents. I think everybody could say that. Now my parents were the cool parents, but they wouldn't let you drink or smoke or anything, but they were still cool. They just weren't cool like that. But it was a while before people were arrested. And now we're starting to get like, people are getting arrested. They're putting out names. They're doing the whole thing. I didn't think they would do that because they're all under, you know, I thought they're all, I think they're all under 18. Um, but they're letting it rip. They're letting it rip. My mother let me drink at that age. Really, Linda? I wanted her 16. I mean, I was doing stuff at 16, Linda. Yeah, you best believe that. I was listening to the um, the chronic album, probably smoking, <laughs> smoking to it. Oh, I was, I was a crazy kid. No, I wasn't that bad. I was a good kid. I really was. Uh, my parents didn't have any problems with me whatsoever. So, We'll go over Caleb Harris's case tonight, and then we'll go over um, the rest of the interview with Nina for Sebastian's case, if that sounds good to you guys, because they both have a few updates. So, um, but I wanted to sh show you this picture of Preston because we're probably going to start. Um, we'll probably start tomorrow going back over the case. I think I have a timeline made up, but it's probably there's probably more to the, the timeline now, so I'll redo it. But um, it's very interesting, very interesting case, um, and then. I've got so much over here on my computer. So I have to change the color of this because it's bothering me. Like, I don't know. We got to, we got to make it match a little bit. There we go. A little better. I'm weird. <laughs> Harlow. I used to ride around on my bike listening to the chronic when I was like 13. I was like six. six. I had to have been older than that then because I'm older than you, Harlow. But yeah, we, and we knew every song on that CD. That's all we played over and over. Um, all the songs were like, all the good songs are old. Like even like 70s, 80s. I like it all. I really do. Um, let me get what we're going to be talking about up here tonight. There we go. So the first person we're going to talk about is Caleb Harris. He has not gotten as much coverage as I, like, I would like for him to have. Um, but similar circumstances to Sebastian. I mean, you know, he was living with his roommates, but the no shoes, the disappearing out of just gone. It's very, very weird. You know, hey, Kai K. Hey, Margo. Welcome in, everybody. Hey, I don't know if I said hi to Roseanne or ALR. Hello, hello, hello. Um, so basically, he was seen, last seen on March 4th. There is a reward of $25,000 um, if anybody comes and says, you know, um, talks about it. Now, this is the part I don't understand. I don't understand this at all. It says a reward of 20. And I, I heard this earlier on the news. I was like, what? A reward of 25,000 is being offered for information that leads to the safe return of Caleb Harris by March 31st, 2024. That is very specific. Like they're like, you bring him back by this day or there's no reward. Like they're just going to rip the reward away. I, I don't know, you know? Cat's life. My dad let me smoke cigarettes because he thought I he thought I wouldn't do it in front of him. I was sixteen, actually. I did it too. <laughs> showed him. He was like, "You sure showed me." I, he's like, "I didn't think you would do it." And I was like, "I didn't think I would either." But here we are. Um, but I don't smoke anymore. It's been a long time. So if you have any information, three six one eight two six two nine five zero. Now I'm just wondering, like, why would they put that? Like, you have safe return. Like, I understand you definitely want him home safe all that. But I don't know. It's just, that's just weird to me. Like the safe return. I would just want him returned no matter just what I want him back. You know, I just want him back. Did I miss someone? No. Thank Jesus loves me. Hey doodle bug. I was like, who am I missing here? What's going on? Um, you know, cause I'm just nosy like that. I like to know. So parents are offering $25,000 reward leading up to, you know, the arrest in this case. I don't know why I have two up here, but we'll just read the first one. Yeah, that's what we'll do. We'll read the first one and then we'll read. Um, I put together a timeline. It's not very long, but it's a timeline. And then um, we'll add to it if we need to. So what we'll do is we'll read over this article to give us a little bit of information. And then um, basically we're just going to go over the timeline and then they did do a interview with the police investigators 
for like the first time that I've seen anybody do an in-depth, um, you know, inv you know, um, interview with investigators. And they also, not only did they interview the investigators, um, or get an interview with them, they, they got a lot of details. So hopefully this will help us get a better understanding of this case. It's, it is a really interesting case. I mean, the only, like, I mean, there's a big difference, you know, Sebastian has like autism. He's 15, you know, I guess, you know, um, Caleb's 21, but it still should all be the same. You know, missing people should get the same amount of like airtime. And I feel like I've been kind of neglecting him. So um, I was waiting for some more updates to come out. So I'm kind of glad that they came out. And then I was reading, I always read the side, <laughs> the latest news. So he was reported missing March 4th. So 26 days ago, three weeks, over three weeks. I mean, isn't it crazy? I was stealing cigarettes from my mom, Linda. That's so funny. Yeah, after walking, his, yep, dis disappeared after walking his dog. Yep, sure did. He was just walking his dog. He went out, basically, um, Caleb went out, and it'll say this in the article too. He went out to take his dog out for, you know, potty break. It was like 2.30 in the morning, but his dad said that wasn't anything new. Like he is known to take his dog out really late at night. He's known to stay up late. Um, and his dad, I talked to him that evening. He was ordering food, whatever, you know, getting his lunch ready for the next day. And his roommates were going to go to bed. He was going to order Uber Eats and then, you know, go to bed after he ate. Well, he walks out to get the Uber Eats because he brings the dog back in. Um, and then he's just gone, vanished, poof, see ya. And he didn't have shoes on. Now I'm assuming, I don't know what, I mean, I don't know what have happened to him yet, but Maybe he didn't have shoes on and he heard something knock at the door or he heard something outside and he thought that was the Uber Eats. And when he opened the door, maybe walked out a little bit. It, it wasn't the Uber Eats, but it's just, it's extremely crazy. This is a crazy one because it literally has you thinking like, what happened? So I, Harlow, I'm wondering that too. Who saw him bring the dog back in? I think the roommates, I know the roommates have been cleared. The, the Uber Eats person has been cleared. And... I think that's it for now. I just started um, like reading back up on this case actually today. Can't even get your food, right, Nicole? Look at this, like with Xana too. Just trying to get some DoorDash. We got DoorDash tonight. First time we've done that in like a week. We've been doing so good over here. We've been doing so good. Um, so this is in Corpus Christi. So whoever um, has Caleb, if you're listening to this, I recommend... You know, drop them off back at home immediately and unharmed because y'all live in Texas. Do you guys know the laws in Texas? We will see the perp walk and everything. They will have it on the news. They will give you a time. It's a beautiful thing there in Texas that they do. <laughs> I love it. Let me see if I can put me somewhere else. Okay, maybe, maybe up here. Okay, so let's read over this article and then we will move on to the timeline. So basically, I kind of gave you a rundown, but um, the Corpus Christi Police Department is still searching for a missing 21-year-old university student from New Brunsfield. Brun now, I think it's Brunsfield. Let me see. I want to make sure I'm getting it right. Bronfels. Bronfels. Now his parents are offering a reward for information leading to a safe return. Caleb Harris was reported missing on March 4th near his apartment at the 1900 block of Ennis Jocelyn Road in Corpus Christi, according to police. CCPD confirmed he attends Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. A lot, of, a lot of it is speculation, but he was either taken or he was outside and saw something he shouldn't have seen. We just don't know, said Randy Harris, Caleb's father. And I heard it was extremely um, foggy that night. Caleb Harris, because like, so that the cameras are kind of messed up, um, Caleb Harris's roommates could not locate him on Monday morning and his family reported him missing later that day. Harris left his keys, vehicle, and wallet behind. He had his phone with him, but it's now turned off, police said. I wonder if it was like the battery died or if it was turned off because they can tell the difference. I really didn't know that until Riley Strand's case. I didn't know that. 
Can I just change your picture? It's very pretty. There's Jen. Sit back. Yeah, be careful. It really is. Happy Easter. Hey, heaven. Is it haven or heaven? Pretty either way. Maybe, yeah, the Snapchat, yeah. Maybe he, because he was filming his dog and stuff. And like he was sending Snapchats to his friends. Definitely. Definitely could be. Me too, Roseanne. Well, Florida, they're second. They're the second harshest. I wish that all of the states across the board were the same. I truly do because it's so hard to know like with this state and this state when you're dealing with, um, you know, when you're doing cases like on YouTube and stuff, it gets a little exhausting because you're like, what, what's the law there? It's not the same here. Um, it's just kind of crazy. So he left everything behind. I mean, other than his cell phone and normally, I mean, normally you have your wallet in your pocket too, but normally you would have your phone like in your pocket, in your hand. People always have their phone near them. Mine's right here. Like, you know, people always have it. I feel like, um, and that's probably maybe why he, like, uh, like Haven said, like, maybe that's why. Hey, bag. People are very scary. Heaven like the place. <laughs> I think it's a pretty name. I'm good. How are you? Um, it says, so where are we at? He had taken the dog out for a walk and the dog made it back to the apartment, but he did not. Now I'm wondering if the dog still had its chain on him, like where he just like walked in, he couldn't even like, you know, get the dog, you know, undone from the chain. I'm just kind of wondering how, um, what the front of the house looked like, you know, if there was any new dents in the door, if there was, you know, anything that could give them any indication that there was a scuffle there, but it looks like they, they didn't see anything. I mean, there's nothing that would have told them either way. Following, following the initial exhaustive but unsuccessful search of hundreds of acres surrounding Harris's apartment complex at the 1900 block of Ennis Jocelyn Drive, criminal investigation detectives turned their efforts towards establishing a timeline for Harris in the hours and days preceding his sudden absence, interviewing his roommates, friends, family members, and acquaintances. Detectives at this point in the investigation have no reason to suspect any of these individuals had anything to do with Harris's disappearance. Officers then went door to door throughout his and adjacent apartment complex, scouring the area for possible witnesses or surveillance video, as well as searching over 30 vacant apartments for the missing student. Man, they're doing their work. Um, KSAT reporter John Paul asked Randy Harris, as we approach three weeks since the disappearance, is there any lost hope that you will be reunited again? And Caleb's dad said, no, not at all. Not at all. We're confident in the authorities, the number of people and volunteers that we have, that somebody knows something and that's what we're looking for. It's devastating to hear the parents, especially when they say like, do you ha have hope? Do you think they'll be okay? Like I would hate to be, I couldn't be a reporter and ask a parent that I would break down crying. I think I'd break down crying interviewing a parent at all, you know, of a missing child. I'd have to be really strong. Caleb, um, Caleb Harris' parents describe him as a fun-loving person with many talents, from pit fishing to football, with aspirations of getting an environmental science degree and plans of becoming a game warden. Oh, if there's something you can um, say to him right now, what would that be? That we love him and that he needs to do everything he can do to fight to get out of the situation that he's in and come home said Becky Harris, Caleb's mother. His parents are offering $25,000 reward for information leading to Caleb's safe return. Caleb is 5'11", 180 pounds with brown hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information is asked to call CCPD at 361-886-2840 or 361-866-2600. And let me... I wonder if I could put all of this in there. I was going to put this in like a banner. Well, look at that. Jesus loves me five months. Next month, your arm will change your little titanium arm. That's awesome. Thank you for being a member for five months. That's awesome. Thank you. It means a lot. It really does. It really means a lot. We were talking about that today.
and our membership, our members um, only. I was going to do something. Oh, I was going to put it in the, the banner in. <laughs> Let me put this banner in just in case somebody comes in. You never know. You never know. Now, I don't know how this is going to look, but. Okay. I think it looks okay. But she can make it like bigger. So, um, that's basically, you know, the gist, that's pretty much the gist of all we have. There is a camera located at the front of the apartment complex. And I don't believe that it got caught. It caught anything on it. Oops. I didn't mean to take that off. Hey, Jenny. Is it Jeannie or Jenny? It's Jenny. I always say that. Oh, thank you. Jesus loves me. And thank you, Jan. Sorry. My footage is okay. And if you're just now joining us, we are talking about the case of Caleb Harris out of Corpus Christi, Texas. He went missing March 4th um, after him and his roommates took the dog out for a potty break. Um, I think his roommates were out with him at one point, and then he went out with the dog, um, And because we have it on surveillance. Then um, he took the dog back inside. I believe it was a new dog. He just got the dog not too long before, um, and took the dog inside, was supposed to be getting Uber Eats. The Uber Eats was there the, month, the next morning. His roommates found it around 11 a.m. They're like, well, where's Caleb? Look for Caleb. They can't find him, so they call Caleb's parents. Caleb's parents, later on that day, they file a missing persons report. He hasn't been seen, like I said, for 20-some days, 26 days. I mean, it's we need to get his story out there. His name, his face, his, everything. Um, definitely need to get that out there. So I'm going to just share this with you guys here. And we'll kind of go over this timeline. Now, it's not very long. I was going to drink. Because like I said, you know, there's not a whole lot to go on. But I'm hoping we'll get a little bit more as the days go on. I know, It's very strange. Yeah, Doodlebug, the food was outside the front door. Yep. His, his roommates actually found the food the next morning. And they found the food, but no Caleb. So I put together like this timeline. They finally came out with like somewhat of like more of the timeline um, and some more details. So I was able to listen to um, news station today, which we're going to listen to. Um, and I was able to kind of like get their, you know, get the timeline down more, a uh, little better. So on Monday... This is going to be March 4th of this year at 12.56 a.m. A doorbell camera at a nearby apartment captures Harris, his friend, and one of Harris's roommates in the parking lot playing with a puppy belonging to the girlfriend of one of Harris's roommates. That's what it is. So at first we thought, it, I thought it was his dog and then I heard it was him and a roommate's dog. So it is one of the girlfriends of Harris's roommates. Nothing appeared out of the ordinary, and the three young men returned to Harris's apartment. Their mutual friend departed shortly thereafter. So there's, you know, roommate, the roommates, one of the, one of the two, and then um, it looks like one of their mutual friends, and they leave. So then it's just the roommates left. So then at 2.20, a couple hours later, the second of Harris's two roommates informs Harris that he, the roommate, is going to bed. Harris replies that he is going to stay up to order snacks via Uber Eats for his school lunch on Monday. And he was talking to his father earlier in the evening, and he was telling his father that he was going to do the same. He was going to do the same thing. They, I don't think they found his shoes at all. I, or, I mean, I think, they're, they're, I think all of his shoes were, like, inside. He was just, yeah, he was barefoot. Um, at 2.44 a.m., so... Uh, 20, what, 24 minutes later, Harris shares a Snapchat video with his younger sister showing Harris walking the puppy through what appears to be the apartment complex parking lot. Now, just like Heaven said earlier, that was a very, very good point. What if he was taking a, a video with a, like a Snapchat video? And what if he caught something on there, like a rug deal going down? I mean, it's 244 in the morning. What are you possibly seeing? But that does sound like it could be something like that. 
That was a very good observation. Gotta say that's that was very good. Um, and then literally, oopsie. Uh, is that it? Hold on, let me see. Okay, we got a couple more. Um, so then he does another Snapchat at 3.03. So 20 minutes later or something, he sends a Snapchat photo to a high school friend in San Antonio showing a small bridge over a drainage ditch on the 1900 block of Ennis Jocelyn Road within a few hundred feet of the entrance to his apartment complex. Let me see here. Um, I'm going to try to like pull it up a little bit. It was, mm, I don't need a project. I just need to search 1900 block of something Jocelyn. And it's okay. Oh, I hate when it does that. I have to close my eyes when it goes to the place. Oh, it makes me dizzy, y'all. Um, I'm just trying to see where the bridge, the bridge would be. He literally lives right beside freaking water, like a big pond, Osseo Bay. So this is Ennis Jocelyn Road. We'll have to look that into that more small bridge over a drainage ditch. I mean, it might not even show up. You would think it would. You would think he would have been over like, I don't know, drainage ditch. It could be anywhere. We'll have to look more into that. I'm going to find out exactly where he was at, like standing at. Oh, thank you, Chris Kennedy, for becoming a member. And you're, my man, you came to Titans here too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Oh, it's not very deep from what the report says. It's a bit, it's big though, isn't it? Like, oopsie, go this way. I hate even looking at these. Yo, I don't know how I got so dizzy <laughs> looking at this, but look, oh gosh, it goes, oh, wow. It goes to Corpus Christi Bay. That's like, I don't know. That's, a, I mean, that's, that's a distance to be going. Hey, Mystic. Yeah, welcome to our family. And hey, Kaylee, welcome in. I saw you earlier. I meant to say something. V math was not intentional. Like maybe there's a struggle. Yeah, V math. Or I'm thinking maybe it was intentional. Maybe and he just clicked the first person. That's weird because to take a Snapchat, you have to do a few different things. You know what I mean? Like you have to like take the picture and then send, like hit the send and then hit like the person you want to send it to or whatever. Um, let's see. I take Snapchats all the time. You go to Snapchat, you take the snap, and then you have to send, and then you have to pick the person that you're sending it to, and then you have to hit send. So there's like a few different steps to that. You know what I mean? What is the name I use in the tune? Um, it's actually just one for StreamYard. And it's called Daydreaming. And it's on the StreamYard app. I just have always used it and I never switched it. Well, I did switch it for a little bit. I had a Steve song on there. I need to change it back to Steve's song sometime. So yeah, I will look into this map a little bit more because um, I'm very interested in that. I'm a visual person myself. And I feel like a lot of people that come over here are too. Mystic, I don't think so. We did an Idaho Live the other day. There was some stuff. He's going to court. I heard he's going to court actually April 4th, too. It, yeah. I feel like the pick on yeah. Also, did you did you see the pick? I didn't see the picture. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks for loving it. It was like the most soothing one I felt like on there. We talk about rough cases. So I was like, let me get something soothing in the beginning. So he sent his last Snapchat at 3.03, and by 3.12, Harris cell phone last shared location data with the nearest cell phone tower. So that has to be right around the time that his phone was turned off. It would, would have pinged, you know what I mean, like somewhere, and then if it didn't ping again, that means the phone must have been turned off, broken, 
went dead, something like that. And then at 3.20, so I kept, sorry, I keep going back, but eight minutes later, the Uber Eats driver delivers Harris's order to his apartment, leaving it outside the front door per the order request. So Uber Eats, they're normally, they're not very, they're not slow. I mean, they're pretty quick. I would say you order your food. I don't know where, about, you know, Corpus Christi is probably very busy there, but you order your food and you get it in about 20 minutes. So you would think all of this stuff could have happened in just a short span. It's just crazy. Oh yeah. Cause she, Oh yeah. Pickle me. I forgot she did. She wrote all she, they did a telephonic um, survey for Idaho. So at 11 AM, this is the next, you know, that next morning after he's already been missing for what? Like, let's see here. Three 30, seven and a half hours. One of Harris's roommates discovered the Uber Eats order outside the front door and Harris's pickup truck parked in front of the apartment. Harris's wallet and keys were found in the apartment. All that appeared to be missing was Harris and his cell phone. So they must be pretty like, you know, into a, like very good roommates, like to where they noticed, like they, they saw the bag outside and they're like, okay, wait a minute. Like they didn't just assume that he fell asleep up in his room you know what I mean? And just forgot about the food. He, they were like, wait a minute. So they go and check, like, is he home? Because they see his trucks outside. He's not home. So then they see his keys, wallet. It's probably sitting either, on, you know, probably right in his room. Probably right in his room. So it's, it's just crazy. Thank you, Jan, for gifting a membership. And Kaylee got gifted it. Hey, Rumsey. Okay, let me grab my drink and then we'll go on to the next. I need to get a cup to put like my drinks in. I'm sure I have one out there that I can use, but I don't want to, cause I don't want to spill it on my computer. I'm just like, very nervous about that. So I'm, I was going to show you this, this video and it's, it's like a minute long and it shows um, Caleb and his, his friend and then the roommate, one of his roommates, it shows when they were outside, um, you know, playing with the dog. And I guess the dog is, um, we're hearing now, was Caleb's roommate's girlfriend's dog. I'm not sure if the girlfriend was there as well. Um, I I used to date a guy and he I had a dog. And he was, um, he had like five roommates. Was, I was young. I was like tw in my tw early 20s. And like they all, they all wanted to name my dog like Fluffy and stuff. And it was an American or English Bulldog. And I'm like, we're not naming her Fluffy. But you know. Um, so they would play with her a lot. So I could see, you know, these guys going out and taking the dog out. So, uh, basically, you know, his parents have offered a $25,000 reward for a safe return. There is a deadline for that reward to be met, which is, has anyone heard of that before? I've never heard of a deadline before, but maybe that's something they do. So people will, you know, maybe be quicker to give them information because they'll be like, Ooh, 25,000, let's do this now before it expires, you know? Thanks, sweetest taboo, for becoming a member. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Otto. Yes, please like and share and subscribe. So let's play this. I'm, this is very interesting to me. And I'm wondering if they are going to get any more surveillance. They've been trying to get it. But I, like I said, I heard it was really foggy that night. And so we'll kind of be, maybe we'll be able to see it on this surveillance a little better. And this is going to be them, like I said, um, this is from the neighbor's ring camera. Thank goodness for ring cameras. Oh, let me turn the volume up. I'll turn it up like as we go so it doesn't hurt your ears. Our coverage this Friday night into the urgent search for Caleb Harris. Tonight we're reviewing new video of the Island University student appearing to be from the last night that he was seen. A ring camera capturing some of his last movements before his mysterious disappearance. So take a look here. Caleb can be seen in the parking lot at his off-campus apartment complex off of Ennis Jocelyn around 1 a.m. 
He was with one of his roommates, a friend Look at the puppy. with a dog. Caleb's face visible as he looked toward the ring camera before they make their way back in the other direction on Cute that kid. night in early March. Look at the dog. And the search for Caleb Harris now in its third week. Just yesterday, his parents offering a reward of $25,000 for his safe return. Now, to create a sense of urgency for anyone who may have information and hasn't come forward yet, a deadline of March 31st has been placed on that reward. You can call Crime Stoppers where you can remain anonymous. And we will, of course, continue to follow this story and update you with any new developments. I don't know who that guy is, but okay. Um, so oh, every time I hit this, it goes to play. Um, so that was Caleb and his friends, like I said, the roommate and then the roommate's friend. And the dog was funny. I didn't, I didn't picture, okay. So when, you know, like when you're, you like are, are hearing about a case, you kind of envision the the people, the places, the things, you know, I, I do that anyway. I don't know if other people do. I, I might be the only one that does that. Um, but like to me, for some reason, when I pictured him going outside and walking the dog, I didn't picture the apartment looking like that. Like the, the front, I don't know why I pictured it set up more like a house. And I pictured this dog being like bigger for some reason, like a big puppy. I don't know why, but that little fluffy dog was cute. You know what I mean? So, oh, and also if you guys are interested, Nancy Grace did do an episode over this. So we could play that also. Not tonight because it's going to be long live because we have still got to move on to Sebastian, but we can definitely play it sometime. Um, so this is going to be like a couple of weeks in the investigation. I might speed it up just because it might be slow, but if not, we'll leave it as is. Um, but this is going to be just the investigation into Caleb. And then after we listen to this, we'll um, start our um, updates on Sebastian. And we'll listen to the rest of that interview from Nina, which is Sebastian's um, stepfather, Chris Proudfoot. It was his ex-wife. It had us in tears last night. So make sure you get the tissues ready because, yeah, it's a it's a good one. I mean, it's a, it, she, needed her, she needed her story to be told. Even if he's innocent, she she deserves her story to be told. And I'm glad that Trev gave her that platform. So we'll go ahead and play this. Don't forget, like, subscribe, share, all those things that are fun. Let me know what you guys think about this case in the comments. This point in y'all's investigation. Well, a couple of things, Bill. Number one, uh, I want the community to know that we this are the still first time they've actively spoke. involved in the investigation. It may not be as visible as it was the first week where you see officers out combing through fields and riding motorcycles and bikes and whatnot. Most of the investigation now is going on behind the scenes. It has to do with uh, looking into digital data, forensic uh, computer examinations and things like that. Earlier this afternoon, I spoke with Caleb's dad uh, by phone. He told me that he was 100% um, confident in CCPD and what you're doing to find his son. One thing that did concern him was all of the social media chatter out there, the disinformation that folks might be spreading, uh, the allegations that mo folks might be spreading. What would you like the, the community to know um, just about some of the details to help clear up some of those uh, misconceptions that are out there? I'm just gonna say this. I mean, it's kind of sad when the police they have to stop their investigation to give an interview to explain why people shouldn't put out misinformation. Does that make sense to you guys? Like he could have been at his desk right now, go, thumbing through surveillance, you know, looking at it, seeing what's going on frame by frame. But instead nowadays, officers and police, it's way more nowadays. I mean, they did it then back in the day, but internet's here. We're here. It literally the um, he has to stop what he's doing just to give us an interview. Like, I don't know. I mean, I'm glad that they do it, but it's just kind of like it's kind of a shame that they have to. But that's probably what his job is to speak for them. So. Sure. Uh, social media can be a great tool for it law enforcement, uh, especially Thank in a search for, like this. We have yeah, reached out through our social media cat. asking for people to submit any tips, any information they may have. But the other, you know, it's a two sided sword. The other side of it is that people start speculating and making accusations and uh, going off on tangents with information that they don't have. And 
unfortunately, we can't tell the public everything that we know in this investigation. It just doesn't work that way. We're not able to be completely transparent and share everything that we know. Uh, but we can very confidently say with that little brush we behind them. out the roommates. I can feel a man with a lint brush. anything to do with this uh, disappearance. His friends that he was communicating with that night uh, over social media, uh, we've ruled them out. Uh, we've ruled out the uh, the Uber driver that um, that uh, made the delivery. Uh, we have investigated very thoroughly all of those individuals. We wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't look at at that possibility that they could have been involved. But we've done that. And we've put put a lot of work into it initially, and we've crossed them off the list. So our next step is, you know, to continue forward and see, you know, what exactly happened to Caleb. We thoroughly searched the apartment. Uh, the roommates were very cooperative with us. Uh, there were no signs of any struggle, any violence. Uh, Caleb's uh, had owned a couple of firearms, several firearms. They were all accounted for. The roommates owned firearms. They were accounted for. Uh, no. The fishing gear, like I said, he was a very avid fisher, uh, fisherman, and there was some speculation that maybe he went to go scout a new fishing hole or something like that. It's not that it's absolutely it seems not. At three in the morning, but all his fishing gear was there. His waders were there. Uh, so there was nothing like that that would suggest uh, that he. Sorry, his dad also came out and said, like, there's rules that he's taught his son. And one of their rules is he doesn't go fishing by himself, especially at night. He just take, always takes someone with you. He was, you know, had gone off on his own uh, for any great distance. With the amount of attention a case like this gets, <laughs> yeah. uh, I love you are talking chat. about a missing college student, this is receiving national attention. How do you handle the amount of maybe tips or information coming in as a police department? Well, we set up a couple of uh, different venues where uh, there again, like I said, we try to use social media to get help from the public. We've made that outreach. Uh, we've given them several numbers to call. We've uh, suggested uh, Crime Stoppers is one of the uh, one of the ways that they can submit anonymous tips if they don't want to be identified. There's also a tip line that the family has set up along with a reward. Uh, those tips come to us. So we I think have a good on me. Let me get it. And for viability to see if they're uh, something that we should be following up on immediately or something that can be delayed, but we review all of them. So, so far we probably got in uh, around 50 tips all together, maybe, maybe more than that, uh, through the several different ways uh, that we're getting them. At this point in the investigation, do you, are you looking locally or are you also looking outside of the area for any uh, information coming in? We haven't ruled out anything at this point. Uh, uh, certainly we started the search immediately right around where he lived, where he was last seen and where, you know, the social media or social media, where the uh, digital information from his phone indicated where he was last. Uh, we've expanded that search um, in, in ways of reaching out to people that had spoken to him on the phone, things like that. Uh, but no, we haven't limited ourselves and we won't limit ourselves uh, until we know exactly where he is. I know there's been a lot of chatter on social media, you know, but uh, regarding his last ping, uh, possibly at a nearby business, what would you like to tell the community, of course, of what you all have learned? You know, initially we were in a, it was a very urgent situation where we were trying to get information back from the cell phone providers and try to get that information really quickly and analyze it quickly. And as a result, uh, I think there was some bad information that it, that it tended to show uh, that his phone was uh, pinging uh, miles away from where the where he lived or where he was last seen. Um, I think as we've progressed in the last couple of weeks and reanalyzed that information and gathered more information from the cell providers, uh, the working theory we have right now is that that last ping was probably right either in the complex or out on the street right in front of the complex. It's an evolving investigation, and that could change based on the, the information that we continue to get back from the, the providers, from the, so, the, uh, the, the social media 
uh, applications and whatnot that he had on his phone and on his computer. So it, it's potentially could change. But right now, that's we feel pretty confident about that right now. Do you still need people in the community, of course, if they might have any doorbell camera, ring camera, blink cameras, anything like that? How much does that help out in an investigation like this? Oh, it's uh, tremendous. Un unfortunately, the night he, he disappeared, it was extremely That's a good looking kid. And the video that we've Smiling. collected already, we've already collected, uh, uh, gone to over 50 businesses was ready to go and back in. Uh, different uh, residents, private residences and co uh, collected video. Of the 50 that we've been to, we've collected, uh, I believe, 27 different sources of video. Um, 27. The, the problem with that is a lot of it is very difficult to um, to see because it was so foggy that night. But it is valuable to us, we're using it. So to answer your question, yes, if, there, if there's anybody certainly within that complex that has doorbell camera that from that evening that they think uh, would be useful to us or anywhere in the surrounding area, we're, we're still looking and we'll continue to look. We're, uh, we've got people out today looking for video, still for video sources, maybe not necessarily right there in that area, but um, the surrounding area. It's ongoing, but we believe the last place that he was seen that we can definitively say he was at is near that bridge right out in front of the apartment complex. And there again, because it was so foggy that night, one of the initial thoughts was maybe he got hit by a car. And But we searched that area so well, there was no sign of any accident, no broken uh, broken headlights or taillights or turn signals, no blood, no, you know, nothing that would, that would indicate that. There's so many people out there who are helping uh, search, mm -hmm. volunteers who are out there, you know, people coming in from outside the city to help in those search efforts. What advice do you have for them to stay safe while they are searching? I was out with a small group of people yesterday and they were going through some pretty difficult elements, the mud, uh, the brush, and so, and they were coming across some homeless encampments as well. You know, first of all, I think it's incredible. The the response that has come from our community, uh, Caleb's community, New Braunfels and San Antonio, his friends, the university, it, it's, it's really an incredible uh, thing to see from our standpoint that that many people are willing to take time out of their day and go out and search for this young man. It's just, it's an incredible uh, thing to see from, from law enforcement side. To answer your question, we want them to be uh, as cautious as possible and, and use as much safety techniques and sef safety tactics as they can. The brush around here is heavy, it's thick. You can easily uh, you know, cut yourself. There's broken glass, there's, there's all kinds of things, fish hooks in a lot of these areas that they're going around in and also uh, venomous snakes. I like have, all the police, have, it seems uh, like in Texas. Uh, rattlers and uh, water moccasins and things like that in those areas. So they need to be very cautious when they're doing those searches. Additionally, one of the things that we uh, we saw was, uh, that I have seen on social media is going down into uh, enclosed areas like culverts, enclosed drainage pipes, things like that. Our dive team, when they did their There's search, so many of they actually have equipment uh, that, that we use al along with the fire department to detect uh, uh, dangerous gases. And uh, we were actually told, do not go in that drainage ditch uh, or that one drainage culvert, uh, enclosed culvert, because uh, there could be methane gas and whatnot in there. So we would certainly encourage them to be very cautious if they have any of that type of uh, safety equipment available to test before they go in there, because we'd hate to see another Testing tragedy. More masks. People that are doing the right thing for the right <laughs> reason. And we would too. certainly hate to see anybody get hurt. Or, you know, are seriously injured. There are a few other missing person cases as well that, that are still open. Um, but when, when you have cases like this or when you have an investigation like this, do you add more uh, people to focus on that investigation or is it a department-wide type of deal where everyone kind of gets involved? Uh, well, in this particular situation, uh, the circumstances are so were so unusual. The circumstances here were very unusual from the beginning. Um, the, our investigators, our detectives got involved very quickly. We're normally, uh, there's a time period before they start getting actively involved. Uh, 
as actively involved. That's not saying we're not doing anything. We immediately put out bolos, be on the lookouts for people that are missing. That that happens immediately as soon as the the first officer gets there and and determines that yeah, there's enough um, to um, to substantiate this person's missing. That happens immediately. So then every every officer in the city is looking for that individual, and if they come across them. Um, just routinely, you know, the dispatchers will let them know, hey, that's a missing person you're talking to. And uh, and we do that. So but in this case, it was much different. So immediately we started getting a lot of people involved. Uh, we uh, had detectives out there. We recruited um, uh, Texas Search and Rescue. We recruited, uh, I say recruited them. We reached out to them to assist in the search. We did a massive search around the immediate area. Um, we brought in our uh, forensic um, computer examiners uh, to download his laptop. Um, we brought in analysts, crime analysts, to go out and start searching for um, surveillance video, for ring camera video, and 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 whatnot. I know there's a, there's been several in social media suggesting look at that, that big camera. Uh, we've had several missing persons of the same age Thank and so males, much. and that you know there there appears to be you know, maybe some kind of conspiracy or something going on. Early on in the investigation, we went back and reviewed all of the uh, missing persons reports for the last three years to look to see if there was any connection. Now, there are some similarities and there's some similarities. Caleb was an act, avid fisherman, avid hunter. Um, we've had a couple other missing persons where it's similar. They're avid fishermen or avid hunters. But there was nothing that we found that showed any type of a connection. Please tell and, me that's uh, not your whole file. Did you see that file he was holding? I hope that's not the whole file, but it could be. I would make is if you had four or five missing young men from Breckenridge, Colorado, it probably wouldn't be a surprise to find out that they were all avid um, skiers, right? Because, because the area we live in, there's a lot of young men and they like to fish, they like to hunt. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's connected. It's just, okay, they have kind of the same interests. And, and that's pretty much what we found. Earlier, I had mentioned <clears throat> that we spoke with Caleb's dad, and he said he was 100% confident in CCPD mm -hmm. that you guys are doing everything you can to find his son. Are you confident in the department and the work you guys are doing to find Caleb? I'm very confident. Uh, I've, I've been amazed by the, the, the work that's being done behind the scenes. We have some very talented people. They're not out on, you know, driving around in a patrol car. They're behind the scenes going through computer data, uh, issuing search warrants for uh, digital information, uh, subpoenas, um, all those types of things. And it's not a glamorous job, but they're doing incredible work. And then just the the amount of sharing that's going on right now between us, uh, we have uh, U.S. Marshals assisting us. We have the FBI assisting us. We have the Texas Rangers assisting okay. us. Okay. And there's no the egos Rangers. going on. Everybody's sharing information. Everybody's working together. So Beautiful. I'm very confident that uh, we are doing everything we possibly can to find this young man. They're going to find him, I feel like, one way or another. I'm wondering if they were drinking or anything that evening. It doesn't really look like they're drunk. Man. And this is the timeline like I gave you guys. I usually put pictures on my timeline too. These are really good pictures. Oh. I haven't seen these pictures. Wow, that's really sad. And then that's the, um, man, I wish I would have seen this earlier. <laughs> I didn't watch the end of this and I was like listening and I'm typing and listening. I'm like, did I get that? I wanted to make sure. Yeah, Ashley, how is your brother? We've been, we've been praying. I couldn't imagine. You think he got jumped auto? I'm liking Heaven's idea. I don't know if she's still in here, but that was, I mean, like, what if he so, like literally saw something or caught something on his Snapchat and that really something he shouldn't have seen? I mean, it was like, what was it? 2.30? 
Okay, three. He sends his uh, Snapchat. Last known connection at 312 in the morning. Like 312, what are you going to be doing at 312? So he didn't receive the order. They just left it at the domestic. His friends found it the next morning around 11 a.m. So and he left with no shoes. He literally, he was outside with his friends with the dog. So what happened was he must have been taking the dog out again. Like, you know, later in the evening, he took the dog outside, brought the dog in because the dog was found inside the home. And then he just disappeared. His roommates were saying, hey, I'm going to go to bed. And he was like, okay, cool. I'm going to, you know, get some Uber Eats and then go to bed. So they have um, ruled out, not ruled out, but they're not looking at, they said, you know, the roommates, the Uber Eats driver, um, the friend that was over that night. So, I mean, it's literally like, who did it? Who did it? It's one of those, you know, what, what happened? So I'm going to stay up on that case. Um, and I think on our next live, uh, Nancy Grace did an episode over it. And I was wanting to play it the last few nights, but we've been um, there's been so many updates. Sebastian's case, it seems like. So we're going to make sure we keep up with Caleb's just as much as we do Sebastian's because they both deserve to be found. And so does baby Elijah. Baby Elijah too. Elijah Vu. Think about him all the time. Um, and also Jesse Vang. Um, face charges related to human trafficking in 2016. So we'll go over that too some night. Cause you know, that guy could, I could really, really punch that guy in the face. That Jesse Vang, the Punisher, the Punisher. So as we all know, this is Sebastian Wayne Drake Rogers. And every time I say his name, I'm going to say, I love it. Heaven, that was a good idea. You know, I mean, that was a great, like, I was like, huh? Cause I mean, if you think, look at, um, Alec Har or who the heck was that? Alec oh my gosh. I was about to name somebody from high school. What the heck? Where did that come from? Whoa. Alec Murdoff is what I was trying to say. The Alec Murdoff trial, or I mean, um, case, he didn't know it, but Paul, 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 his son, took a Snapchat in the dog kennel to send to his friend because this um, his, the dog was injured a little bit by one of the other dogs or by the kennel or something. And they went to the trial and Alec, Alec Murdoff's all smiling like you ain't got shit. <laughs> and then the lawyers are, uh, then the lawyers prosecution's like, we have this Snapchat video <laughs> and if his friend corroborates it, that it is Alex's voice and Alex's voice in the background. You know, that was amazing. Amazing work right there by police and everybody. Um, but this is, like I said, Sebastian Wayne Drake Rogers. We know who he is. We love him around here. He's adorable. He's missing. He is 15 years old. He is funny. He looks like he, you know, likes to have a good time. He likes to smile. Um, his father said that, you know, he likes to play video games um, and things like that. Be outside. Just fun, doing fun things that little boys do, you know? Um, I write notes every single night and I never look over them. We're all the, we're all the way halfway through the live. Um, yeah, yeah, and there's like, I have like no notes for him because I don't need notes for Sebastian. I mean, I don't really need notes for Caleb either though. So I wanted to show you all this because you know how like the Cajun Navy, they pulled out and then they said, because people were threatening them and they were just like, we're not dealing with it. We're out of here. Um, and then the other night on the live, I said, you know, I think that personally, and this is just my personal opinion, if you're afraid of people like, like okay, so technically, you know, Chris and Katie are not charged with anything yet. As much as I think that their stories are winky wanky different, they're not charged with anything. So for them to have to leave their home because they're scared of people coming there, then like that says a lot, right? So they 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 move into their camper because we're gonna we're just gonna play devil's advocate like they didn't do nothing wrong. They move into their camper and then they have all of a sudden a TikToker JLR knows where they're at. I don't know if they followed them or what. But I just, you know what I mean? If that was me and I didn't do something wrong, even, you know, I just, I, I feel bad for people that like have to be hiding from people because then you've got this. 
You've got JLR said, and I want you guys to tell me what is wrong with this picture. And I'm going to read you the caption first, because that says a lot. I tried to warn y'all that Chris Proudfoot's stepdad, Terry, ain't right. He chased me around Hendersonville in his car. Tonight, we heard the horror stories from Chris Proudfoot's ex-wife, Nina, on what Chris and Terry did to their children. Sebastian Rogers is still missing. Tell me what's wrong with this picture. Anybody? I, I commented. He's behind the damn car, you guys. He's following them. They're not following him. He's behind them. Like, JLR. Stop lying, man. Just don't be doing that. People are liking my comments because I'm like, oops, did he reply? No, he didn't. I thought he did. Let me see. Maybe he did. I'm not saying the winker lies a lot, but his lie jar could finance the space program. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, that's funny. That, that one was funny. Um, but I said, just an observation. How is he following you when you're the one behind him? I mean, really though. I mean, I don't, I don't think that they're, I'm not saying they're good people. I'm not saying anything like that, but I mean, this is, should be about Sebastian. This is like, I just, I mean, I don't know. I just couldn't imagine, you know what I mean? Just imagine if I just imagine if these people, the, okay. Technically these people didn't do anything. Even if they were terrible to Nina and terrible people and all of that, they didn't do anything to Sebastian. And that's the case that we're talking about. You know what I mean? So we have to kind of put two, like the two cases separately because it's, I feel like they're getting put, to, I don't know, put together. And then it's just, it's making everybody go crazy because it's making me mad too, because I hear Nina just pouring her heart out. I feel like she's never had the opportunity to fully tell her story. And she deserves that. She deserves to tell her story. I just feel like, it's different than from Sebastian. And I'm wondering, like, I want to hear from the police because I haven't heard, like, I want to know when Chris Proudfoot was away. When was he at work? Did he go to work the day before, you know, a couple of days before? Like, when was he down there at work? I'm, I want to know that, like, for a fact, you know. Yeah, Linda, he goes too far sometimes. Thank you. Be happy. Give to 10 memberships. Hey, Ramsey, go up into the... Crew, we got Mel, Suze Marie, Suze, Mar Suze Mara, Christy, Jenny, and Jennifer. And okay, W, Yolanda, Harley Girl, Robin. Wow, thank you. Be happy. Will, will you send me those doggies? They're cute. Yes, look at that. Everyone's green. I love that. Thank you so much. Oh, you saw the video. Oh, there's a video, PKC? Oh, I didn't see the video. It was like a cat and mouse game between the both of them. <sighs> JLR just, I mean, he's got to make that money. I ain't lying to y'all. Like he could do, he could be fine with it. Just reporting the news there. But like, this is, this is like, I mean, no matter what, this is a little, this is a little much, you know? Um, <sighs> I don't know. I don't really know what to say about it. <laughs> Cause you know, I mean, JLR has a tendency to go a little, little on the edge, a little too far. I mean, he went to Summer Wells' parents' hotel and was knocking on the door screaming, where's Summer? I mean, he's known to be a person to yell, but we love him for that. Actually, I do. She said, don't you love how your family grows daily? It's really a blessing. It, it's amazing. It's, a, it's amazing, like, how many friends I've made on this platform, like, and family, because most of you guys are my family. Isabel isn't here right now, but she's included. That girl's been riding with me since the beginning. <laughs> I got to get her a bloopers video of me. She's been wanting one. I've been wanting one. If anyone's out there that's a content creator that does like clip videos and you want to do a really cute one, I mean, don't do any like bad ones, but you know, me just like making mistakes because it's funny. Um, I'll pay you to do that because I think it'd be so much fun <laughs> just to see it. Police did pull JL over to man, damn, you see y'all. I didn't even go to his page. Like I didn't go to JLR's like actual page. I just commented on that one post because am I following him? I'm, I, I, I didn't even know I was following him. That's why I'm getting all of his dang posts. I was wondering why he was all over my time. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah. He just brings you the news. 
I, oh, wait. I went to a federal prison for nonviolent white collar crime. I served my time. I've been out of prison for eight years now. I'm not on probation. I'm not on parole. I'm a free man. I live a productive life. I use my platform to make a difference. Man, that's what they said. That's what he said. I mean, I agree. He's been doing, he's been doing better, but then he comes and does the, it's just like these little things, you know, it's like, dang it. Oh yeah. T not here. I've got the Trevor. Yeah. So this is, um, Trevor, like Trev time, Trevor. And actually let me change the banner. I have one for him. And that way everyone knows where we got the interview. Let me go to his page and, um, actually let me put this in the chat one more time. So Caleb Harris, his family is trying to, you know, get money together for, um, any expenses that they may come across that they may need whether it's putting towards the, you know, um, reward or, you know, if they end up getting their child back and not in the way that they want to get their child back, they have to plan for, for that. Um, and then with that, his siblings, I'm sure as hell, his sister's going to need therapy. You know, if that happened to her, um, you know, he sends her a snap. I don't know if she saw it that night, next morning. I can only imagine if that happened to me, that was my brother. I would feel like just some sort of guilt. It just, it's, it's just human nature. So, Hey Gene, he just got off parole. I was say, I thought he was on parole. He just got off parole. That's why he's putting that out there. He's like, I just got parole. Cause I was like, how's he traveling to all these States? But he did like 10 years. That's a long, and you, if you looked at him, you would never think you would never think he's so like boyish, little boyish. I don't know, but let's listen to Nina. I love her. I think that she, I mean, this woman is so strong. I love Trev time, the way he did this interview where he just let her speak. He didn't ask any questions. I love it. I love it. I love it. If I ever do an interview like this, I want to do it. Like if I ever do an interview with missing family, I would like to do it like this. He really, um, did a good job. And then also there's an, um, there's a letter from the grandmother of Sebastian. So Seth's mother, um, came out with a letter or a little note. Let me blow it up a little bit here. If I can. Oh, look, I did it with you guys. I don't even on the camera. Let me see. Um, it's kind of like off a little bit. Let me move it over a little bit. Okay. So I was kind of surprised about seeing this. Yes, Marianne, he is. He was with, he, I met him through Brooks um, on Crime Lines and Lies. So it says here, and um, that's why, I mean, I didn't really meet him, but that's where I know him from. Um, but it says, I want to thank Nina Gomez for having the courage to stand up to the Proudfoot Bowersock family. It is important to shed light on the type of people we're dealing with here. I just want to restore what I had said before. We, the Rogers family, are not afraid of Chris, Katie, or any member of the Proudfoot Bowersock family. We find our own grandson or we will find our own grandson. We will prosecute anyone and everyone involved. You can follow us around to try to intimidate us. We are re relentless in our searching justice for Sebastian and ultimately for Faith, her siblings, and Nina. And Faith is Sebastian's sister. Stand by. We are on our way back to Tennessee for an Easter miracle. Thank you all for your continued support and prayers. Now let's find Sebastian. Beautiful. Now let's find him. Um, and his mother, of course, is defending, you know, her leaving by, because she's, she's saying now that he, her husband was going back to work, but on Nancy Grace, he said he wasn't working. So I don't know. I don't know that story. They're, they're not, I mean, they can't run. They're going to have eyes on them anywhere they go. Cops are going to follow them, but it's very, it is weird that, you know, they left with their camper. I mean, they have a big enough house. I would think one or two YouTubers wouldn't really scare me. I would just maybe call the cops if they're on my property. They can't be on the property. I don't know. I don't think I'd want to pay to sit and sleep in a camper. You know what I mean? You got to do a hookup station, all that. I'm cool. I would just. And the storage out. unit. And Texas got my property. At that time, I didn't need anything. Because I had everything I've ever wanted. She cries during this whole interview. It's terrible to hear her. My dad's saying, come on, we got to go. 
So we went to the sheriff's department. Because I had everything I've ever wanted. I'm going to take it back just like a couple minutes. That way you guys know. Um, she's basically recounting her story with her time with Chris Proudfoot as his wife, as the mother of his child, Faith, um, and as his ex. I mean, she's speaking from the heart. This woman, if anyone thinks she's lying, y'all need to get your head checked and your eyes checked. There's no way that. Unless this woman is speaking on another story, you know what I mean? But she says she, there's no way she literally is so heart. It's so heartfelt. Um, she talks about the abuse that she encountered with him. She talks about how he wasn't at the hospital when she had faith. Um, he didn't even want to really hold her when he came in to see her. Um, her mom had to ask, do you want to hold your, your daughter? Um, he said, I guess so. So, um, he wasn't a present father. He wasn't a good person to her at all by any means, not even a little bit, but she stayed because that's sometimes what happens. And then when she tried to leave, he pretty much twisted everything, went to social services, child services, child CPS, and tried to turn everything to where it was like on her. So she ended up losing custody of her daughter. Um, and she had to get a lawyer and she had no money. And she said she took off her wedding ring, handed it to the attorney, and was like, I'll pay you back every penny, like pleaded with him. And um, she ended up getting getting custody back. So that's kind of where we're at right now. So um, I took it back a couple of minutes just to kind of like remind us where she was. Because I thought we stopped at a pretty good He's spot. like, let's go. And our attorney, my attorney followed me outside and we went out and they're just, they're, I don't know. There was just so much chaos coming from the Proudfoots, and we went outside very humbly, and um, he took us in back of the court, the courthouse the other way, and right there, and then I hit my knees, I finally could be relieved, like a big, like, oh my God, we just, <laughs> we did this, and he said, 30 go pick her up I said thank you Mr. Edwards I said I I owe you my life to get my I mean you help me get my baby back so then we went back to our track and we went back to the apartment we packed what we could and we pretty much left everything else behind in the storage unit at that probably time her children's I didn't thing. Anything. that's sad probably her baby's things because i had everything i've ever wanted I remember my dad saying, come on, we got to go. So we went to the sheriff's department. And we showed up. And I remember my dad. I told my dad, I said, wait here. I said, stay at that Wendy's. So my dad stayed at that Wendy's waiting for me. And he said, oh, okay, he's like, you call me when you're on your way so I can follow you out. Okay. And I said, okay, dad, we got to the sheriff's department. I'm so glad she had her dad. We, Christopher and his, Michael, Linda, Kathy, Big D, Melissa, his whole entire family was there. So then the exchange was happening and they live streamed me on Facebook. I said, I can't, they said, I can't believe the judge awarded her custody. 
Oh, that's like, that, that's another thing too. Um, when she went to court, I guess his side of the aisle was filled with people like family, friends, blah, blah, blah. And her side, it was just her dad. It was just her and literally her father. And they were like laughing at her when she came in, mocking her. Then when she won, they were flipping out. They were just flipping out. They're wild now. You know, and, and they were, I was just sitting, standing there, I remember. And I said, can I have my baby back, please? And I remember his mother had her phone in her hand. Or his mother, yes. And she had a brown paper sack full of, it was full of diapers. And a dirty bottle. Oh, my God. Like, you and want she that? she threw it at me. And she said, I think you're going to need this. <sighs> laughing. Then I said, thank you. She had to keep her hands to herself, man, for her daughter. And my two younger children were sitting in the back. And then I said, okay, can I have faith back now? So I forget if it was Kathy or Chris, but they tossed her at me and I caught her. And I said, thank oh you. Oh my God. For that, you know, they, they were supposed to be wanting this. We all knew they didn't really want this child. They just didn't want her to have the faith. But for them to physically throw her, she's a baby. She's just a baby. Throw her at Nina. And you can tell she smiles because she's like thinking back on it. And she's smiling because she's thinking back like, I caught her. Thank God I caught her. That's sad. So then I get her in her car seat trying to buckle her up and telling my kids I said you need to buckle up I said okay we're gonna leave I remember at the time my front door had opened at that time and Christopher got inside of my driver's seat of my truck and everybody was still filming live streaming me on Facebook and Melissa Proudfoot had said why don't you put it in reverse and drive over her And I told my kids, I said, you know, I'm trying to get faith out again. And I told my kids, and I remember he put the truck in reverse. And I told my kids, I said, get out. I said, jump, get out. Oh and I remember God. them. That's remember traumatizing them for the kids, too. As they could. And we're running into the sheriff's department, and I had faith, and I'm running. And I'm yelling and I'm asking for help. Is it somebody, please help me? Nobody came out. And then finally, he came in, Christopher, behind me. And finally, they finally opened the door. And they put me in a back room with my kids. They turn the lights off on us. In the process of me calling my attorney to tell him what was going on, Kathy disconnected my cell phone. And I remember Mr. Edwards calling the police department and telling them they need to let me go. And at the time, Christopher was still in the military and Mr. Edwards, I remember them telling him, you know, you need to let, she needs to go because this could possibly call him, cause Mr. Proud, but his career. He didn't care. So at that point in time, I got escorted outside by a couple of sheriffs that were there. Um, but I, I mean, they said they seemed like they knew each other, all of them, the Proud Foot. Oh God. So and they're like, I remember they're like known in the community. Christopher had asked one of Poor the girl. sheriffs if um, he could say goodbye to Faith, and I said, absolutely not. So I remember getting in my truck after I got the kids in, and I called my dad, and I told him what happened. He was so mad. He goes, he was lucky I wasn't there. 
I'd have knocked the shit out of him. He said, so I said, all right, Dad, I'm coming. Well, everybody followed me down the interstate. My dad and I were weaving in and out of traffic, trying to lose them. The whole family were following me and dad about 80, 90 miles an hour. We were going down the interstate just to get away from them. We drove all night. We finally got to Little Rock, Arkansas. And dad had asked me, are you tired? I said, I could, I could see if I could try to sleep. I couldn't, we couldn't sleep. So then we drove all the way home. We were all scared. We didn't know, we didn't know what was gonna happen. We drove. The relief that I had just to see, I, I've never felt so relieved to see that New Mexico, welcome to New Mexico time. She knew she was, was away from him. Home. Finally, we made it. Okay, so right here, I just thought of this. I'm not sure where I'm not sure where she was living at with Chris. I forget the state. I didn't realize that it wasn't New Mexico. Um, I forgot. I forgot that part that they had moved. So he got the CPS order in New Mexico. So this happened to Faith when they were living in New Mexico. Like, this is going to be something that she's going to probably say now. Couple, Chris kept calling and calling. And, I and waited. We, this is only an hour. We were already an hour like, in. Or a little less. Because the judge in Tennessee awarded me custody. He had no jurisdiction over Faith or myself or my other two children. And at the time of all this, they brought CPS involved in that case over there. So we get home here. Not even a couple of days goes by. He call, ended up calling CPS on us here. And <clears throat> using CPS against me every chance that he got. Showing up to my kids at school. Scaring my kids, just like he did in Tennessee. So I filed for divorce here, which I should have filed on tribal land at the time. Because I wouldn't be going through this. So the divorce happened. But it dragged on and on and on because Christopher made a big deal about absolutely everything. I had to ask for permission to leave Bernalillo County. I had to tell him what I was doing. And if I left New Mexico, he had to know. I am um, part Native American. So our reservation is probably about four to five hours from Albuquerque. And at the time, my grandmother was still alive. So we would go out there to see her. And um, he really never wanted me to take Faith out there. And on top of that, he really never wanted Faith to be Native American. Um, Christopher knew. She's gorgeous. That I was Mexican American and also Native American. I thought she was just, Mexican. He, he hated the fact beautiful. that. And he still hates the fact that Faith is part Native American. So why? That's beautiful. We, I mean, just everything. He would take me back to court for just every. I mean, everything. It wasn't a good divorce. I don't want to make this about ethnic groups, though. But I am going to say something. Native American people don't get enough credit in this country. They really get put on the back burner, and they shouldn't. They really shouldn't. And she's gorgeous. First. I would love to have her hair. And the parenting plans, it had to be his way or nobody's way. He had to have the last word. Well, Peggy and this is and what hot. he wanted. <laughs> and his attorney made sure that's exactly what he got. Hey, A lot of times I gave in 
because I wanted it to be over. I didn't want to have to or have somebody dictate what I can and can't do. I mean, I've been a mother for an X amount of years at this time, and it wasn't like, you know, I'm new to all this. But everything had always had to have been Christopher's way. And even though I gave him what he wanted, it was something different. Oh, you know, Faith can't wear leggings or, you know, just, just the stupidest things or, you know, it, it was dumb. I can't even recall how many hearings I went to with Christopher. It, it, I mean, it was, it's just been, it's been horrible. So at this point in time, um, I didn't really agree to the parenting plan. I, I didn't like it, but I signed it anyways, just because I wanted it to be over with. The divorce was finally final. Um, and he was still stationed, I believe, in San Diego at this point in time. Uh, he was, if I'm correct, he was already living with Katie when we were still married. Uh, we were going through the divorce, but he had moved in with her. Oh, so and I was pretty surprised how fast he moved on with his life. Like, I'm going to say that she knew. Like, we didn't. We oh, never I didn't know the details, like, Faith was like he never had a family, but I should have known that as well prior to the marriages before me. Like how he just moved on so quickly with his life. Yeah, so it was five times. I he would take Faith out there when she was little, like for two weeks or a week, and you know, I. Katie and them would be living the, the family life. I, at the time, did not know Sebastian or Katie. I would just see Katie through FaceTime where she would be doing something in the background. And I would ask Christopher, like, you know, I can't, I, or I would tell him, I can't believe you've moved on with your life so quick. Like, like who does that? Well, back and forth, we would be going, you know, with Faith. And... I finally moved on with my life, but Christopher had made a statement the other night on one of the, the, the interviews, the podcast is that he was doing, and I didn't like the way he said this, you know, how he, how he didn't, he called my relation, you know, moved in with a man, like he knows this person's name. And he deserves to be called his name, not the man. And remind you, I've known Wayne for over three and a half years. He was my client before we even got exclusive, like being in a relationship, before we even moved in together. He knew I had children. I mean, just so for him to sit there and say that, uh, I just, he basically made it sound like he didn't know this person. He does. So. It doesn't Here we matter are. anyway. He didn't know Katie. Six. I'm still living in this nightmare that he's created. We live in fear every single day. We're constantly watching over our backs. My kids don't even know what a normal child should feel like. Because they were exposed to all this in, at a very young age. The awful things that other people could do. My oldest daughter said it best. She said, Mom, I feel like I was robbed of my childhood because of Chris. Because of everything that he's done, I've had to grow up so quick to to protect my siblings and, and you protecting us and always living in fear. Being called to the office and wondering if child protective services were there. She's 15 now and still hates to go to the 15. office because of everything that he's done and his family has done. I feel helpless because I, I can't, I, I feel like there's, I can't protect them enough. And I wish there was more that I can do. 
we're still living in this nightmare. We're still going to court. He still complains about everything when it's not his way. In the beginning, there was CPS called. He used Child Protective Service on me because of the divorce um, to get my children taken away from me. He has a friend that works at Albuquerque Police Department as well. That was that. I don't know if he still keeps in contact with him. I believe so. Um, he was told to do a welfare check on us one night. But he didn't take the call, probably because he knew both of us. I, I mean, I don't know, and I don't know how that would have been used against him either, I guess. I, maybe he was worried about that. Just, um, he's been filing for full custody, Christopher, for about a year to two years now, if I recall. A lot of this stuff is just, it doesn't make sense to me. Um, he's made, he's made a mess. He tells people that I'm unstable, that I need a psychiatric evaluation, <laughs> that I'm, you know, that, that I'm pretty much crazy. It's, I mean, it's just, it's been a nightmare. And the recent one, why he's pushing for full custody is because I moved Faith out of Bosky Farms Elementary to a Native American Academy in Albuquerque, where my youngest son goes and my oldest daughter goes down the street at a high, from, to a high school and is admitted away. So I was trying to make the commute easier for all of us. My, you know, all my kids are in curricular activities. My son's in football. My Faith cheers for her brother's Yaffle football team. So practice, my two older girls are in Mexican folk dancing, or no, my, I'm sorry, Faith and her older sister are in Mexican folk dancing. Um, my children are in 4-H. So my kids Mexican are super busy and I work in the city as well. So trying to make my life easier, I decided to put her there. And he did not like that, him and his attorney. So they're pushing for full custody about that. I mean, I can't even recall how many other nonsense issues have been brought up. I, my children, myself, I mean, we just, it's, I'm, I'm over it. I'm tired. This has worn my whole entire family down, my children, myself. All this is like the first thing I think of when I wake up and the last thing I think about when I go to sleep. Uh, we, there's no words to explain this feeling. I mean, and on top of that, we went to, uh, we were supposed to go to trial March 5th, I believe it was. March 5th and the first one, yeah, March 5th, I went to court January 2nd of 2024. Um, Continuing cases, I had to pay for his attorney fees uh, because I pulled Faith out of Bosky Farms. Although I contacted him through email, he never replied to me. I contacted my lawyer at the time, he never replied to me. So what was I supposed to do? I mean, I had to do what was in best interest for Faith and everybody else. So I ended up paying the legal fee for Christopher because his lawyer complained about that. So then we went to trial. We got a, we got a date for trial. Boy, I was furious when I left my lawyer's office. I feel like I hire all these lawyers that just don't, that never took the bat for faith and listen to anything that I have ever said. I've always told she people in the past, violence, counselor. The people that were working for faith and myself, the kind of person that Christopher really was. Why didn't the cops hook her up with like a, a domestic violence case manager? Someone to go to court with her, sit with her, comfort her, let her know the law. Somebody dropped the ball there. Nobody listened. 
I mean, he's hurt my children. He's hurt my son. He's backhanded my son as well and busted his nose open when he was three in the car seat mm. in San Diego. Oh he's did God. that to my daughter. He's hurt Faith in the car seat, like I said. It's fallen on dead ears. It's coming up on seven years. Nobody listens to me. Nobody knows the pain that a mother that I went through. Nobody knows that I live in fear. It's like back and forth. It's like a game to Christopher with Faith. Christopher dangles Faith over my head as if she's like some kind of toy to be played with. She's not a toy. She's a little girl that has feelings and strong feelings. We can't help the fact that Christopher decided to move to Tennessee. He chose that for himself. I've never known of a person that lives in a whole different state and still dictates what you can and can't do to the other parents. He, I mean, he had a choice to live here. He was actually told to move here by the judge. But he lives in Tennessee. He tells me pretty much what I can and can't do still to this day by that court order. So, going back to the trial, I was getting prepared. And, um, I get the call. You get a call. And at this point in time, you know, I, I'm, I'm not talking to Christopher. We, we don't. I want to make that loud and clear. We do not have a good co-parenting relationship. We don't talk on a regular basis. I refuse to talk to Christopher because everything has to be his way. I don't entertain any of his conversations in the past when I used to, and I thought that a relationship between him and I, and we're learning how to co-parent and it's good, it backfired. It kicked me in my ass. Everything that I told he used against me in court all the time, every single thing. So I had to learn not to trust him. I've had to, I, I just, I don't, I don't talk to him. So for him to say on some of his podcasts is that he has, he, you know, we have good, you know, parenting skills or we know how to talk to, we don't know how to talk to each other. I refuse to communicate with this man. So he calls me I, that Wednesday and he's like, and I was like, oh great, he's calling. So I just went straight to voicemail. And then he had said 911, call me. So then I was like, well, it must be emergency. So let me call him. I called him and I said, what's that, Chris? And he was like, you know, he's like, Nina, I, I, I got to tell you something. And I was like, and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, he's going to tell me that the trial, we're not going to go to trial, that everything is going to be done with and we don't need to worry and we can, you know, we don't need to do all this stuff. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. And then he tells me, I got to be open and honest with you. And then he pauses like for six or seven seconds and I'm like, what? I was like, what? What do you have to tell me? So then at that point in time, he tells me that Sebastian went missing. And I, I was speechless. I have to say I was speechless. And then I went into saying, well, what happened? Like, how, I mean, how did he go missing? Like, what happened? And he said, well, he went missing between 12, 1230 and 6 a.m. And I'm like, I, it's thinking to myself and then, you know, like, that's that's crazy. And I said, don't you have security cameras, Christopher? I said, you mean you have security cameras in your house? I mean, don't you? And he paused. He didn't say anything. So then. I said, what happened to your dogs? They said, don't your dogs? They said, you have those Yorkies or, and I said, every time that I call Faye, they said, they're barking. 
He didn't say nothing. So I said, huh? Where's the dog? I said, are you lying to me? I said, because I mean, thinking in my head, like, are you just buying more time for this trial that's coming up? Like, you know, what other information are you going to find out that you're going to use against me? Right. So then I said, I'm going to look this up. And I said, have you contacted your lawyer yet? Do you, I mean, you know, I said, we still have a trial. I said at 830 next Tuesday. And he had raised his voice at me and he said, we're not going. And I was like, don't raise your voice at me. You are not, you're not going to disrespect me like that. You're not going to raise your voice at me. So then I said, you know, by law, I said, I have to contact my attorney. And I said, I'm going to email him as soon as I get off the phone with you. And I'm going to tell him that there's a missing child. <laughs> and I had stated like, okay, well, is there like something, you know, we could do? Can you send me like a flyer? Can you send me something? I said, you know, I could put it on my social media and it'll take off. Like I have a lot of my, a lot of people that I know and a lot of my clientele, I said, we're willing to, I mean, they share a lot of my stuff. So he, he you know, never, he never sent me anything. And um, he was so worried about his phone and he had said something. He's like the you know, the, the, the fucking cops had my phone and I, I had to call Thief and I had, I had, to, I told him I had to fucking call my daughter. And I said, Christopher, I said, you need to, you need to calm down. I said, Faith is fine. She is with me. I'm her mother. I said, she was with her family here. I said, you, you don't need to worry about her. You don't need to worry about her whatsoever. And, um, that, and he wanted to say more and he kept, he repeated himself again and he said, I need to be, I need to be honest with you. And I was like, Christopher, I don't have time for this. I said, I just, I just don't. I said, I gotta go. And that was it, the conversation that I had with him. I keep kind of beating myself up. Maybe I should have stayed on the phone a little bit longer. Maybe I should have let him talk. But with the experiences that I've had with Christopher in the past, I, I, I just couldn't trust him. So then I contacted my attorney the next day and I told him what was going on with Sebastian. I, I, I mean... I was hoping that, you know, and I keep hoping and we're praying every single day for his return home. But the more and more days that had passed by, the more and more that I got, you know, like, oh my God, like, this is like, this is crazy. Like, and the things that didn't make sense to me was why Christopher and Katie aren't looking for Sebastian. I don't know, but I know if I might be one of my babies went missing, I'd be out there searching night and day. I don't know how somebody could just sit at home and just wait for your baby to return. When I'd be out there looking every single second, I'd be out there by horseback. I'd be out there by a golf cart, by whatever I can get my hands on to get into the forest and look or wherever in these, these neighborhoods, wherever I could possibly go. I'd still be wearing the same clothes that my son or daughter went missing in. I'd be running on adrenaline. That's what Seth's doing. All I could think about is the time that that happened to me when they took faith from me. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't even drink water. I lost so much weight and I knew where my baby was at. And this hits home for us because of Faith. Faith's known Sebastian pretty much half of her life or her whole entire life. I 
I feel for Seth. I feel for the for his his family, the Rogers family. I'm in shock. I, I'm just I, I just I can't believe this has happened. You know, and and Faith asks me and she talks about Sebastian and And she asks me, Mama, are they going to find him? And I tell her, yeah. I've talked to Seth on a parent-to-parent -parent level. And we've talked, we talked about some things that, you know, we both I mean, we shed some tears together and just the pain in his voice. I can, it, it hurts. But I've been, everybody, I, I feel like people now want to listen to me. People now want to hear my voice when I've been saying the hurtful things that were done to my children and to myself. Nobody wanted to listen to me before. And now that this baby is missing, you want to listen to me now? You want to ask me questions now? Like I feel, I just feel helpless. Like I don't know what to, what to even think anymore. I see all these things that are being said and the things that people say, and you know, they have every right to say that. They have every right to speculate. Just like I have, I, I, I've, there's so many things that I've thought about in my head, but I mean, I've saw the things, I've sat back for a month, literally, and watched everything and followed every possible thing that I can, listen to what people have said, podcasts, like everything. She's probably so invested and in I, him. You know. She's a child with him. I needed for my voice and my story to be heard of my experiences with the Proudfoots and Christopher and Katie. So wait, if her daughter's Katie jumped on, she said her daughter was 15, right? So her daughter is the same age as Sebastian. Wow. He really moved on quick. Like that's a quickness. Like was she pregnant? When they got that I'm like confused or about that a little bit. That Christopher and everybody else was on. Just Have like this past December 27th, Faith was going out to Hendersonville to see her family for the holidays. We drove her to the airport. We were all happy. We all got out. Isabella, Noah, Wayne, myself got her out of the truck and we said our goodbyes. We hugged her. We kissed her. There's Katie standing there recording everything like she always does. And I hug my baby tight. I tell her I love her. And we prayed. We asked God to keep Faith safe and bring her home safe to us. So as she went with Katie, I had somebody that Christopher, Katie, and his lawyer hired. His name is Michael Tinker. He served me with paper. And he tapped, before, he tapped on my window when I just rolled it down. And he said, are you so-and-so Gomez? I said, yes. Why? He said, because you've been served. And the first thing I thought of was, they're going to take faith. I got out of that truck so fast and I ran into the airport. 
and I was going through the airport that she was going to kidnap Faith. Katie and Faith were standing at the Southwest counter, and I told them, I said, she's going to kidnap my baby. So Katie was there. I grabbed Faith on the left side of her hand, and I ran with her through the airport. And all I could think about is, I, I, I got to get back to the truck. And here comes Wayne, Noah, and Isabel running through the airport just to come and see what was happening. And oh my God, my mom, like, like, <laughs> first thing she thought of was like, and Wayne thought was like, oh my God, Nina's going to just lay her out. Sure. I, ran, I ran by and, and Katie was coming right out behind me and the guy, Michael Tinker, he stood there trying to flag me down and still trying to serve me with paperwork. In that moment, I'm just thinking about they're going to take my baby and I'm never going to see her again. So I got to the truck. I called APD. During the holiday season, APD is at the airport. So they came within like five minutes. Officer Cordova had showed up and was talking about asking questions like what was happening and asked if I had a parenting plan on hand. And I'm like, wait, I mean, I when I was just supposed to carry my parenting plan, I mean, and he said, is it his time sharing or yours? And I said, it's his. But I said, why am I being served? And still at this point, Michael Tinker was still trying to give me my paperwork and I wouldn't take it. So he got very upset, lifted up the, the windshield wipers and threw the paperwork right under there. At this point, my kids are crying. I'm crying hysterically. They're probably hysterical. Could you imagine? Terrifying. And there's Katie smiling away and recording everything. What is up with them recording shit? Then the officers like Ms. Gomez, you have a you have a court date coming up. And if you don't want the judge to be upset with you, you need to let her go. <laughs> so you get back out of the truck. And we all do. And they get down to Faith's level. And I tell her how much I love her. And that mommy's going to always keep fighting for you. And don't ever for one second think that mommy does not love you. I hug her so tight. Because I don't know if that's the last time I was going to see my baby. <laughs> I handed her off to Katie. And she left. I could barely breathe when I got back in the truck. Penny. <laughs> trying to think about what do I do now? What do I do if she doesn't come home? <laughs> How am I going to get her home? Faith stopped. And she looked at the truck driving away and Wayne looked back. And she probably thought, is that the last time I'm going to see my family? The whole day, my whole world was turned upside down. <laughs> I thought about everything that played in my head, like a movie. <laughs> that day was hard. 
I came home and I curled up in a ball. I didn't want nobody to bother me. Because I'm thinking about how am I going to have enough money to get a lawyer or anything like that. Like, that's genuine to me. Like, I feel like if she was making any of this up, like, she wouldn't think of, I got to get a lawyer. How am I going to pay for it? I, I, I don't know. This is genuine to me. This is sad. So what they did. Sebastian helped her get her boy. They hired that server to come and serve me with a court hearing that I already knew about. The one that was going to take place January 2nd. So Christopher's lawyer, Christopher, Katie, they all knew what they were doing. They premeditated this again. They wanted me to go crazy. They wanted me to say hurtful things so they can go back to the courthouse and to the judge and say that I was unstable and that I'm mentally, something's wrong. And That's what they did. Christopher and Katie and his attorney asked that I get evaluated by a psychiatric um, doctor. Well, obviously because she's gonna have anxiety, depression, PTSD, maybe a little OCD from it. I mean, you know, I'm just saying. I ran through the airport saying that they were gonna, she was gonna kidnap her. But in mm -hmm. my mind, I've been traumatized by Mr. Proudfoot and his family. And I brought back trauma. And now, I mean, we're at this point where, where Sebastian is missing. And everybody, you know, the, the judge and, you know, other people are telling me, don't talk about this issue in front of Faith. She's too young. She's traumatized. Oh, from her? Christopher she's not traumatized about that to her. He doesn't tell her that her stepbrother is missing. Not once has he said anything to her about it. Wow. I think Faith needs to be aware of what's happening. She did talk to Sebastian when she had FaceTimed Chris and he was at his house. She knows him. I have I really don't know what to say at this point. Like with Sebastian missing, it, the situation with Faith, it's been an ongoing situation. I was unaware that Sebastian's father was getting him I was unaware that he was going to live with his father permanently. Finally, that was disclosed to me about a week and a half ago. I, I just, I was in shock because I was, I went like, how can you know that you're getting your child for full custody? Like, I mean, you and Katie were preparing for this. You're giving away one kid to get another one. Like, I, I just, I never understood that. I didn't under, I still don't understand that. I, I was in shock when I heard that. And I also, you know, was, 
it's sickening to think that and to think that you would be getting a child. Why would she take Faith away from everything that she knows? Her mom. Her siblings. Her siblings. She calls Wayne dad. She says, that's my daddy Wayne. Her grandparents, like oh, everything. Wow. I, I, I don't, you know, I was lost and now the more and more I find out, it just makes my stomach turn even more like going back to this, this court hearing that we had, I never, we never got an extension on the restraining order, but I believe that we should have. I did because I don't know what Christopher nor Katie or the Proudfoots are capable of doing. Chops always should have a restraining order. For all I know, they could take Faith from school. Um, I do right now have temporary full custody of Faith till we go back to court. I mean, I talk to to. I Seth. mean, they give her full custody. Like, I mean, wouldn't there have to be something that's going on? I mean, they didn't just say like, you know, you get custody and then he gets to see her on the weekends. Like, no partial, no nothing. Like, full custody. I feel like they don't like to take the parents out if they don't have to. And I, I've always told him, I, I reach out to him and I let him know, you know, we're here, whatever you need. Let us know. Let us know how we can help you. But I remember him telling me the first night that I reached out to him and, or he reached out to me and he said, you can, you can help Sebastian and you can help me by keeping faith there and keeping her safe. When you hear that from another parent and the situation that's going on, What do you say? Like, I'm doing the best that I can. But it's the justice system here. My biggest fear is that somebody's going to make the wrong decision for Faith and she goes out there. And what am I going to do? What if something like this happens to me, baby? Are you going to tell me I'm sorry, Ms. Gomez? I made the wrong decision. <laughs> the justice system has failed a lot of kids, has failed my kids, and it's also failed Sebastian. It's failed so many. So I've many. been fighting this since Faith is a newborn, and I'm still fighting it. I don't know what it's going to take. I don't Someone needs to start her a GoFundMe. Really cares the decisions that they make for children because it's not happening in their personal God. family. They don't know somebody. It's not. It doesn't hit home. It'll never happen to them. A lot of these people would always tell me, don't show your feelings in court. Don't be emotional. So I'm just supposed to sit there without feelings, without crying, without telling people how I really feel. I feel like a lot of these also because there wasn't enough creamer in their coffee for you know a lot of these judges that make these decisions and maybe they got angry that morning or whatever the circumstances are. So this is what she thinks, maybe. They make bad choices for a lot of these children. And I won't let faith be one of them. I will always fight for faith like I have been.
I wish people would open up their eyes and listen to when people are saying it's not a good idea. I don't think they're stable. I don't think that they're healthy parents. I, I you know. Because look at what happened to Sebastian. And I fail for him because I'm a mom of a 15 year old daughter. I hope and we pray every single day for his safe return. If there's anything that I would say to everybody is look out for one another, look out for your kids. And no relationship is worth your children's relationship at all. at all. So I believe I had to tell my story so it can get out there because it still haunts me to this day. It haunts my children. It haunts our everyday life. We don't live a normal life. We're always living on the edge because of Mr. Proudfoot. I mean, his mother and his mother wanted to pay off the daycare, buy them some new playground equipment, just so Christopher and his mom can stay there longer to see Faith. Wow. This is like the Murdoch family. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, my mind is all foggy right now because thinking about everything that I've went through, I'm sure I left some bits and pieces out. But I know what I've experienced and it wasn't a good experience at all whatsoever. So that's our story. Okay, I was on mute. <laughs> yes, prophet tentacles all over the place. Yeah, Micro Kimmy. Wow. Isn't that like, that was a lot. That was a lot. Um, I'm trying to figure out how old he is. Why isn't it just like not pulling it up? Um, I think, I thought he was like, I was guessing my age, like 38, 39, maybe early 40s. I don't see it on here. If anyone knows, let us know. So I remember seeing it. Oh, are you curious? Yet? Yeah, I went right to his went right to his channel. I, I'm surprised he's on this late. He's not usually on this late. He's 40. Okay, Micro Kimmy. So 40. Wow. I bet you if if he's involved in any of this, and I'm just thrown out there. I bet you he tries to use some sort of, I was in the military as an excuse because I've seen it time and time again. A lot of times I've seen something so traumatic. So it made me do something so traumatic, but who doesn't he marry the restaurant server busted him? Yeah. That's what I heard. I heard, man, <laughs> my hubby said tonight, good thing. I can't get my hands on him. He'd be done. That's so funny. Let me, uh, I was seeing if Vincent was still awake, but I texted him and he didn't say anything back. You think he looks older? Maybe he, maybe he does. He, maybe he actually does kind of look older. Let's see if I could pull up. These are all of Sebastian. I'm so glad that Sebastian has his father, the father that he has. I mean, his real dad, you know, Seth, um, he's busting his ass. It's literally reminding me of Crystal Rogers case all over again with Tommy Ballard, her dad. Her dad was, what, 50, 51? I thought he was a lot older than that. Remember, I thought he was like 70. Sorry, Tommy. But he was in his 50s, and he was out, I mean, searching everywhere for his daughter. She's still missing, but they are um, prosecuting people for that now. So here's, yeah, he does look a little bit older than that, doesn't he? Probably that facial hair he got going. 
but this is a good picture because this is this is a different way of seeing them. I don't know because when they I for the first two interviews, I really felt for them. I really did. And then all of a sudden he started lying. It was like, why are you lying? Why are you lying so much, dude? Like you weren't even supposed to be there that night. Why are you bringing up stuff? Like I hit him with the belt. Why would you even tell people that story? I would never. <laughs> if I did that to my child, my stepchild, let's say, and my stepchild was missing, I think that I would be like, eh, going to hold on to that one. You know, I'm not going to tell him about the, the belt deal. But he was just like, let me tell you, I love criminals. They're dumb. You know, they're really dumb. That's just, that's just the greatest thing about it. Hey, Livia. So, wow. Yeah, that's all I really have. Um, I was going to look to see if there's anything new. Let me see if there's anything new over on Twitter. Cause you know, sometimes they happen some stuff. And then the Kate, um, Caleb, um, Harris case, we will go over the Nancy Grace, maybe on Monday. Um, let's see. I thought I saw something. Um, just thanks for, um, like searching. Wow. And then the, the letter that are the thing I sent or I showed you guys from his grandmother. And then just, um, wow, look. Wow. Look at them people. Look at this guy. Oh my Lord. He's got his gun. Hell yeah. Hell yes, yeah, sir. He's going to be safe out there. He took his sunglasses off, took his cigarettes out just in case he falls in that water. He ain't taking no chances. He said the gun will be fine. Wow. Very impactful interview. So if you missed the first half of my, my girl Kimmy, we played it yesterday. Um, and then this was the second half. So she did a two hour interview. Trev or Trev time just like opened up the floor for her. And I thought that was really, really great how he did that. Um, and he did it as a premiere yesterday. And um, I did have his banner on here. Let me go to his channel again and let me get you his, um, his YouTube because he really is really good. He's very nice, very kind. He when he's been out searching for him. Um, he's been covering this case ever since it happened. He's been covering the case of Summer Wells ever since it pretty much happened. He's extremely um balanced. I feel like, you know, um stays pretty balanced. So, yeah. But that's all I have for you guys. I hope you guys all have a great Easter if I don't see you tomorrow. Hope you guys have a great day. I hope you get to spend time with your family, your friends, or if you're by yourself, take the day, do a self-care day, something just for yourself, you know, and then just think Monday, all the candy is going to be half price. So save your money. Don't get no candy tomorrow. Tell them kids they can wait one more day. Did your parents ever ask you that? My mom used to ask me that every Christmas. Can we just wait a couple extra days? <laughs> Stuff goes on the sale. I'm like, no way. As an adult, I'd be like, hell yeah, we could wait. But um, like I said, go ahead and go over to Trev Time and subscribe to him. He's a really good creator. And if you're into missing children's cases, that's what he covers. So thank you guys for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Don't forget to, you know, hit the like, subscribe, all that good stuff. You know, we tell you to do. We are trying to get to 15,000 subscribers over on this channel. We're going to do a big giveaway. We're going to get five. We're trying to get to 500 on the second channel. And then we're going to do a giveaway over there as well. So Hopefully you guys will subscribe to both channels, but thank you guys for being here. I will see you tomorrow sometime um, throughout the day, throughout the early evening. So um, maybe I'll put up a community post, see what time works for everybody. Since you guys might be with family and friends tomorrow, but have a good night. Eat a lot of food for me tomorrow. Eat lots of food, eat lots of candy and um, try not to rot in your teeth out too much. You know, <laughs> have a good day, but good night guys. Bye. Mm -hmm.